So we're going to begin with exam one review and we will start out with part one, which is the cellular biology and genetics. So let's go ahead and start with cellular biology, metabolism and adaptation. So when we look at that cell, it's absolutely fascinating. But why do we have to know things about the cell? Well, for one thing, all, pa all pathological processes really begin there. Um, so every single system that we go through over the course of the semester, we're going to keep coming back to the idea of what is it doing to that cell. So for example, when we get into heart failure, uh, we talk about tissue perfusion. And tissue perfusion, that's all related to the inability to supply that cell with the, with the needed nutrients as well as oxygen. So we're gonna see what happens to that cell, that hypoxic injury that we talk about later on, as well as a little bit in this lecture. Um, but it's all about the effects it's going to have on that cell. You also have to remember that the cell is very finicky. It has to be within a perfect 7.35 to 7.45 pH. Um, if it's not, it can com compensate somewhat. And that's also the amazing thing about the cell is its ability to adapt. And we're gonna talk about some of those adaptation mechanisms here in just a minute. So let's just real briefly just go through some of the basics of the cell. So the nucleus, huge, huge, very important organelle of the cell. In fact, the nucleus, it has a really tough membrane and inside that nucleus is the nucleolus. Well, the nucleolus, its main job is to protect DNA. So DNA is like the queen bee and we're gonna talk more about DNA in when we go into genetics. But the main function is that it really is for cell division and that control of once again genetic information. So genetic information is transcribed into RNA. So DNA never comes out of that nucleus or that nucle uh, the nucleus. And what it does is it uses RNA to do its work. So most of the processing of RNA actually occurs in the nucleolus. So what about ribosomes? So with ribosomes, they are RNA protein complexes. What they actually do is their main function is to provide sites for cellular protein synthesis, very important. So newly formed ribosomes, they actually have an address um, that actually sends them to the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum um, actually makes it into that final protein chain that's necessary for the body to function. The Golgi complex, on the other hand, is really, it's all about the refining plant and directs traffic. I know that sounds very simple, but that's what it does. And so they're really located, you can see where the Golgi um, bodies are really very close to the nucleus. So proteins from the endoplastic reticulum are then processed and packaged into small membrane bound sacs or vesicles. And these are called secretory vesicles. So the Golgi complex, once again, is really all about a refining plant and directing that traffic. So let's go to lysosomes. We're gonna come back to lysosomes quite frequently, particularly when we get into the GI system, as well as when we talk about genetics. But lysosomes, this really, they maintain cellular health because what they do is they remove toxic cellular components. They get rid of useless organelles. They also have a termination of signal transduction. So what that means is also they recycle cellular components. They, are, they have the capability of taking um, a cell and taking it down to its very basic components and recycling some of those amino acids. Absolutely fascinating. Aging can lead to a progressive loss of lysosomes and therefore, the lysosome efficiency and decline of the regenerative capability of organs and tissues. They also have a 
very, very sophisticated network for cellular adaptation. So they also can produce um, or facilitate something called apoptosis, which we're going to talk about here as well in just a minute. So let's talk about the last main player, mitochondria, very important in cellular respiration and energy production. In fact, um, these enzymes that are within the mitochondria really are very essential in the process of, of oxidative phosphorylation. So what is that fancy word? So that fancy word is literally energy produced from carbs, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, therefore transferred to ATP. So sometimes you'll see in some textbooks that we call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. So that's a nice brief overview, overview of cellular biology, and it will help us as we move through some of the disease processes and pathological processes of the different systems. So now, as promised, I want to describe the difference between apoptosis versus necrosis. So when we think about apoptosis, it really is a programmed death. And in fact, the lysosomes can actually activate this process. But we think about it as usually a physiological benefit. All right. And let me describe one example. Next, in exam two, we're going to go real in depth into the inflammatory process. So when we think about the inflammatory process, it is a good thing. But what happens is neutrophils, right? Neutrophils come in there and start trying to clean up any bacteria. They're sort of one of the first responders. But anything that is turned on in the body must be turned off. And so here's an example of apoptosis. So the body comes in and takes those neutrophils and starts destroying them. But in a very, very good, very good process, you can see on this one PowerPoint here, look at that normal cell. So let's pretend that's a neutrophil. And what you see is it's very, very functional dismantling of that cell. No problems, okay? Let's talk about necrosis though. Now necrosis is irreversible injury, no going back. An example of that is for example, myocardial infarction, which we'll talk about of course with exam three. But myocardial infarction, this is necrosis and things begin to leak out, all right? So you can see where the lysosomes are destroyed. And with the lysosomes, that's the digestive system of the cell. And so it must stay within its membrane. But with necrosis, everything pours out and the cell is destroyed. What we do know is no matter what with necrosis, an inflammatory process is in place, okay? The other thing with necrosis is that we know there's swelling. And with apoptosis, there's shrinkage. And so once again, the difference is necrosis is chaotic and can cause an, and doesn't cause an inflammatory response versus apoptosis, it's very programmed. All right, very programmed and it's a careful dismantling. So that is the difference. So next, let's talk about that adaptation. Adaptation of the cell is amazing. What we do to our bodies on a day-to-day -day basis, and yet the body keeps fighting and, and, and compensating for all these horrible things that we do. So let's talk about some of the adaptation. Atrophy. So atrophy, it can be very a physiologic process. Um, for example, the thymus gland, it atrophies during childhood. That's normal, a very normal physiological um, adaptation. However, let's talk about pathologic. So pathologic is actually something called bed rest. So when we don't get up and move our patients, um, muscles begin to atrophy and actually leads to something called disuse syndrome. And so that as far as atrophy, it can be physiologic, the thymus gland atrophies, no problem, pathologic bed rest. Let's talk about hypertrophy. Now hypertrophy is actually an increase in the size of cell. So for people that love those pictures, you see on the side here, uh, normal cells, then you see that atrophy. The next one on the slide there is hypertrophy. So you can see where the cells get bigger. So a 
good um, adaptation is, for example, uh, endurance training. So a marathon, a marathon runner. So the cardiac cells, they increase in size, everything is wonderful, and they begin to hypertrophy. But, you know, if they stop running, then of course it goes and reverses back to that normal size again. So that's a good thing. But let's talk about pathologic hypertrophy. So with pathologic hypertrophy, this can be secondary to something called hypertension. So we're going to talk about hypertension all by itself later on with cardiac, but this is a really good example of, of pathological hypertrophy. So the myocytes, they increase because of that continued stress, but that hypertension, that high blood pressure keeps pounding that heart, and over time, that hypertrophy will now diminish the functioning of the heart. And once that hypertrophy takes place, we have to control it with certain medications and hopefully no further damage ensues. Next is hyperplasia. So hyperplasia, as you can see, look at all, them, all the increase in the number of cells. So something that is actually good is when it compensates with removal of 70% of the liver. So 70% of the liver can be removed and it can regenerate itself in about two weeks. Pathological is something called endometrial hyperplasia. A lot of times we associate this with endometriosis, which we'll of course talk about when we get to the reproductive system. So metaplasia is another type of adaptation. This is a replacement of cells. The problem with this is the replacement of the cells, the cells that the normal cells are being replaced with, don't function properly. So it doesn't take over the function, all the functions of the normal cells that should be in place. A great example of this is um, with smoking. So smoking tobacco, or I don't know, maybe other things, but I do know tobacco for sure. Anyway, the uh, normal columnar ciliated epithelial cells of the bronchial lining, they're going to be replaced with stratified squamous epithelial cells. Now, that can be reversed if the person quits the irritant, such as cigarette smoking. So it's kind of neat. The only problem, though, is what those cells are being replaced with is that they don't produce the mucus that's needed, and it also destroys the cilia in the lungs. And so we've got to get our patients to quit smoking. All right, so those are the four major types of cellular adaptation and examples of physiologic versus pathological adaptation. So let's go into cellular metabolism. So cellular metabolism, we know that ATP is energy, but it needs oxygen, right? So we need oxygen for um, ATP to work at its best. But ATP is really the energy transferring molecule. So when it needs oxygen, so a reduction in ATP levels causes the plasma membrane sodium potassium pump. So we're going to talk about in part two, we're going to talk all about that sodium potassium pump. But remember I said that cell is very finicky. And what I mean by that is there must be a proportional balance of sodium inside the cell and outside the cell. So the sodium potassium pump runs on ATP. So if that pump is not working correctly, what ends up happening is sodium, too much sodium stays inside the cell. Now, where there's sodium? Water correct? So what ends up happening is that sodium will start causing the water to accumulate in that cell, causing that cell to swell and potentially um, the swelling would cause, of course, dysfunctioning of that cell and therefore could cause death of that cell. So sodium and water, they can intercell freely and once again, cellular swelling. So what happens when we don't have oxygen? Well, here goes the body, very adaptable. But it'll cause, uh, it can run for a while without or diminished, I should say, diminished oxygen supply. Um, but treatment has to, has to reverse and supply that oxygen, otherwise the cell does die. So it can use an anaerobic metabolism, glycolysis, for some time. 
Um, but once again, byproduct of that is something called lactic acid. So lactic acid builds up. And we're going to talk more about that lactic acid buildup that's going to cause a metabolic acidosis when we talk about this in part two. So oxygen, very, very important to that functioning of the cell. And I'm sure that does not come to a surprise. All right. So free radicals. So lots and lots of literature um, has been out there about free radicals. You know, people spend, I don't know how much, millions of dollars every year in um, different kinds of over-the-counter medications for antioxidants. Uh, eat your broccoli. That's real good for you. But um, so a free radical, what is it? A free radical is an electrically uncharged atom or group of atoms having an unpaired electron. So you can see this beautiful, healthy cell, and now it's being attacked by free radicals. Remember, every single day, um, we make 10 billion cells, and 10 billion cells are destroyed. So really, free radicals are a natural part of our body. It's just that we also have antioxidants that protect us against that. It's when those free radicals or those ROSs become overwhelming to our body. And what are some of the causes of this? Well, some of the causes of producing more free radicals than our body can produce is things like cigarette smoking, pollution. Do you live in an urban city? Um, pesticides. Do you live in a rural city, you know, part of the country? And of course, the ozone layer. So there's many ways our bodies are bombarded every day. Some we have no control over. But once again, we eat nutritious meals. We take care of ourselves. We don't smoke, blah, blah, blah. And the body can usually compensate and adapt to those free radicals and get rid of them. So no problem. So what ends up happening though is injurious chemical bond formation with proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, and therefore those key molecules in the membranes and the nucleic acids. So it can, and we know that it can cause cardiovascular disease, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and even diabetes mellitus. So cellular injury, let's go back to this a little bit more. So when we think about cellular injury, we go back to that lysosome again. So when we think about those lysosomes, enzymatic digestion of cellular organelles, including the nucleus and nucleolus. So the stuff inside those lysosomes need to stay inside that membrane. But when injury happens, it begins to leak out. And so what's going to happen? could go after that nucleus membrane, destroy that, and now there you go. The queen bee, as I call the DNA, is now going to be possibly destroyed. Let's talk about some of the big, big um, causes of cellular injury. Ethanol, alcohol, right? So liver, liver enzymes metabolize ethanol, ethanol to um, acetylaldehyde. And Acetylaldehyde is very toxic to um, hepatic cells. We're going to talk about cirrhosis in and of itself later on, but let's talk just a little bit about what it causes at that cellular level. So um, peroxisomes help detoxify ethanol. So between the, um, the hepatocytes and the peroxisomes, what it's going to do is it's going to rid that toxic ethanol from the body. However, with chronic use of alcohol, the body can't keep up. It can't always adapt. And so what ends up happening is that ethanol is not properly detoxified and it turns to fat. Therefore, the term fatty liver. Let's also talk about radiation. So with radiation, remember DNA, it's very fragile. That's why it's housed in its own little nucle um, nucleus, right? I mean, it, it just hangs in there and it's very well protected. So, but radiation is very powerful. That's why as healthcare providers, we always need to protect ourselves. Make sure you're wearing those lead aprons. I know sometimes we get in emergent situations and we don't grab that apron, but please take care of yourselves. All right, so that ionizing radiation, it's all over, it's everywhere. All right, so what we don't want to do is um, uh, have any more, um, for example, when your patient's getting an x-ray. So once again, protect yourself. But anyway, it's all over in the environment. And the thing about radiation is it targets and it's most vulnerable to destroying DNA. So 
very important concept. So let's talk about aging. So aging in cells and tissues. So this varies dramatically between patient from patient, but depends on how they care for themselves. All right, we're going to get to genetics here in just a minute, but we also know the environment has a lot to do with our, our um, ability to age gracefully or not so gracefully. So uh, muscular atrophy, so that's just called sar sarcopenia. So that's a little bit of that wasting, but once again, you know, we teach our elderly patients to do that weight training and walk, that kind of thing. Peripheral vascular resistance, it is gonna increase. Once again, depends, you know, do they also have a history of hypertension? So that's going to depend also. But overall, somewhat, all these things that are listed here are going to have some impact on that aging process. So, of course, the decreased immune response. So we want them to eat well, um, protect themselves, wash their hands, things like that during that flu season, get that vaccine, and so on and so forth. Some of the other things that happen is that um, de decreased production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Some of that is going to be diminished. And so sometimes that decreases that ability of the stomach to empty. So when they do eat meals, we want those meals to be packed full of nutrients. So genetics, don't let this scare you. It's all good. What we're going to do is talk about the basic genetic um, components, concepts, all right? When we move through the rest of the systems, we're going to talk a little bit more about those genetic components. Maybe some of you did not have genetics in your BSN program. Don't let that worry you. Believe it or not, all along, you were always asking about, did you have a family history of cardiac disease? Even though now we actually know there is gen genes that can um, tell us whether or not a patient is more susceptible. Um, and so, so don't, don't be afraid of genetics. Let's just take it down a notch and let's just talk about some of the major genetic diseases. Remember, some of these genetic diseases, like the recessive, very, very rare. So we're not going to get into all those. So let's talk about chromosome aberrations and associated diseases. So aneuploid cells are defined as those that do not contain a multiple of 23 chromosomes. We need 23 chromosomes, right? So an amploid cell containing three copies of one chromosome is caused, is actually called trisomic. So a very well-known um, disease with a autosome of trisomy, trisomy of the 21st chromosome, Down syndrome. So Down syndrome, individuals with disease that with this disease typically have intelligent quotients between about 25 and 70. They have a very, very distinguished phenotype. Phenotype is how the disease is portrayed. So the facial appearance is very distinctive. They usually have a very low nasal bridge, protruding tongue, and those flat, low set ears. So this is trisomy of the 21st chromosome. So let's talk about a few principles. So genetic principles, so penetrance versus expressivity. expressivity. So penetrance, for example, is actually, it's the trait is a percentage of individuals with a specific genotype and also exhibit the expected phenotype. So the phenotype is what you can see and what the patient is actually showing the clinical manifestations of. The genotype is what exactly has the gene because remember someone can have a gene but may not show clinical manifestations of the disease which is the phenotype. So let's talk about this a little bit more. So the penetrance of a trait is the percentage of, it, of individuals with a specific genotype who also exhibit the expected phenotype, the characteristics. Incomplete penetrance means that individuals who have a disease calling, causing allele may not exhibit the disease phenotype at all. So when we talk about cystic fibrosis, that's a good example because the parent can just be a carrier because it's a recessive disease. So even though the allele and the associated disease may be transmitted to the next generation. 
So that's a, that's a good example. We're going to talk about cystic fibrosis in just a minute. But let's talk about Huntington's disease. It's a well-known autosomal dominant condition. So what does dominant mean? That means that with dominant, autosomal dominant condition, they only need one allele, all right, one to make the gene become a phenotype. So in other words, to express that gene. Versus with recessive, they need both of them, okay? So you can see a capital A with a little a, and they will have Huntington's disease, all right? So Huntington disease is a well-known autosomal dominant, which means chances are they're gonna get it, 50 chance, 50% 50 chance, and its main features are progressive dementia and increasingly uncontrollable movements of the limbs. One of the key features is that the symptoms and signs are not seen until after the age of 40 or later. So this is known as age-dependent penetrance. The problem with this is these people have already reproduced. So the chances of their offspring having this disease is quite high because once again, it's dominant, all right? It's a dominant allele. So most genetic disease diseases also exhibit variable expressivity. So when we think about expressivity, it's the extent of variation in the phenotype associated with a particular genotype. So once again, with cystic fibrosis, sometimes the pancreas is not involved and it's all just respiratory. So it's very dependent on, you know, what are, how is it going to express itself? What is the severity of the symptoms? So those are two pretty major concepts, penetrance versus the expressivity. So let's talk about autosomal recessive versus autosomal dominant. So I kind of already talked about this, but the most lethal autosomal recessive, remember recessive is, is much weaker. Um, and so both allela, allela must be recessive. So they have to have both, okay? If they only have one, that means though that they can carry it, but have no phenotype, so they don't show any signs and symptoms of the disease. So this is a very common uh, lethal autosomal recessive disease in white children. So because an individual must be hom homozygous for a recessive allele, which means they need both to express the disease, the carriers are phenotypically normal, all right? So because most recessive alleles are maintained in normal carriers, they are able to survive in the population from one generation to the next. So which genes are responsible for an autosomal dominant form of breast cancer? So we've done a lot of research on genetics and cancer. So we know that with breast cancer, we talk about the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. Um, a good example of this is, what's her name, Angelina Jolene, a few years ago actually had bilateral mastectomy because she was positive for these genes. It really raised a lot of awareness about um, genetics and the potential for breast cancer in women. So actually, she did a really good thing. Uh, right now, if it is inherited, BRCA1 or BRCA2, experience a potential 50 to 80% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. So we do know, and all along we always asked, do you have a family history of breast cancer? Well, now we have genes that can actually be tested for it. Right now, the cost of that testing can be anywhere from $250 to $350. Most insurance will pay for that, but remember, some people don't have insurance, but there's other means of getting that paid for. So we help our, our patients with those resources. All right, so how common is a given disease in a population? So once again, here's some concepts. The incident rate, and this was also in your workbook, the incident rate is the number of new cases of a disease reported during a specific period. Typically, we use one year divided by the number of individuals in the population. Pretty simple. Relative risk is something that we can use that's very important when we try and talk our patients in to stop doing bad things to their bodies. So let me explain this. So relative risk is a common measure of the effect of a specific risk factor. So it is expressed as a ratio 
And so let me give you an example. So the incidence of death from lung cancer is about 1.66 in heavy smokers. That's about more than 25 cigarettes daily. But it's only about 0 0.07 in non-smokers. So, so what, right? But this is what you can do. So what you can tell your patients is that your relative risk for lung cancer is 24-fold. In other words, they have a 24 greater chance of getting lung cancer than those that don't smoke. That might be maybe a little bit more powerful motivator in trying to get them to stop smoking. So some of these particularly relative risks can help hopefully motivate for your patients to maybe, stop, for example, stop smoking. Okay, so let's talk about genetic processes demystified. So you've all already heard about nurture versus nature. So we know genes, we're given a set of genes, okay? But with those genes, we have something called environment. So once again, go back to the idea of where we live. So for example, with identical twins, they've done a lot of study with identical twins, twins because they have, they have the exact genetic makeup. So with that exact genetic makeup, if those twins are parted at birth, this one lives in an urban city and has asthma. But this one that might live in a rural, more cleaner environment, didn't get asthma. So we can tell that with epigenic above genetics, uh, modifications can cause individuals with the same DNA to have different disease profiles. Absolutely fascinating. So after twins age, they demonstrate increasing differences in that methylation pattern of their DNA sequences, causing increasing numbers of phenotypic differences. And that's what I just explained about the child that has asthma in an urban setting, but the other twin, identical, doesn't. So that's where those environmental factors such as diet and exposure to certain chemicals may cause what we call epigenic modifications. But there's a difference. So unlike DNA sequence mutations that's related to genetics, which cannot be directly altered, although we're working on that, epigenic modifications can be reversed. So let's take that child out of that uh, highly polluted area. Let's put them back. Let's put them back into a nice clean environment and maybe Maybe they still might have a little bit of asthma, but not that profound phenotypic expression. All right. So that's kind of the difference. So epigenics definitely can be reversible, whereas DNA sequence mutations, genes cannot. All right. So let's talk a little bit about when messenger RNA goes rogue. So there's something called non-coding RNAs. They play a very important role in regulating a wide variety of cellular processes, including RNA, um, splicing, and DNA replication. Remember that DNA, that's the queen bee. Once that queen bee is, is gone, is dead, is mutated, once again, everything comes to a stop. No longer can protein be synthesized, and the uh, DNA is so important that it never comes out of that, that nucleus. It has little critters called RNA to do its work, all right? Well, one of those RNA types is messenger RNA. The thing about the messenger RNA is that um, it is very important with um, DNA, its replication, um, and it sends messages, messages, messages on how to, let's say, produce protein, okay? So a particular relevance to the gene regulation are something else called microRNAs, which are encoded by the DNA sequences, all right? So what do they do? So microRNA typically modulate the stability and the translation of those messenger RNAs. So they're little helper guys. That's what I, I refer to them. So the thing about microRNAs, if they go rogue, what can actually happen is they are actually linked to carcinogenesis, which means 
cancer. So because they alter the activity of those onica genes and tumor suppressor genes. So we think about microRNA, they can be helpful, but when they go rogue and start overexpressing, what that can cause is metastasis and therefore cancer. So that is the end of part one to get you started on reviewing for exam one. The live chat will be in the next week and you can certainly ask me questions. I'll refer to the Canvas email would be the best way to contact with questions and certainly be watching announcements for part two. Part two will contain the fluid, electrolytes and acid-base balance. Thank you and have a great day.